Hi, listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. There are a lot of things in life that are difficult to describe. We search for the words to explain our emotions, and those words often feel inadequate. The circumstances that spark the most intense emotions tend to be the most difficult ones to articulate. Love, awe, grief, fear, anger. These emotions sometimes evade explanation. That's why it can feel so gratifying when we hear someone else give voice to something that we can barely grasp for ourselves. Catherine Schultz has this gift. Catherine is used to finding the right words, and she does so with precision. She is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margins of Error. She won a National Magazine Award and a Pulitzer Prize in 2015 for The Really Big One, an article about seismic risk in the Pacific Northwest. Her newest book, Lost and Found, applies that precision to the emotional earthquakes of losing her father Isaac, falling in love with her now wife Casey, and the and of life continuing on with both grief and love. Lost and Found grew out of an essay she wrote entitled Losing Streak, which was originally published in The New Yorker and later anthologized in The Best American Essays. Catherine and I talk about the legacy of curiosity and wonder that her father passed down to her, about why the word lost felt the most apt to her in her grief, about becoming a parent without her father, and about how she continues to find wonder and hope in the world. Okay, here's my conversation with Catherine. Catherine, thank you so much for making time to be on Grief Out Loud today to talk about your new book, Lost and Found, amid what I imagine is a flurry of book promotional interviews. So I'm just grateful for you making space for our show today. It's really my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, your father, Isaac, as he's described in your writing, he just strikes me as someone who like fully embodies the phrase larger than life. And I, I just wonder, when you think of him, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? Mm. Uh, I'm really happy to say that mainly what I feel is joy. Uh, obviously, you know, that was not the case immediately after he died or, or for some time because it was so mingled with, with just overwhelming grief uh, at his loss. But uh, my father was a really joyful person, and I think he'd be pleased that that's what he left behind. Um, he comes to mind for me now as uh Yes, you know, the person who, um, if he walked in and joined us in this interview right now, um, he would uh, immediately hijack it, not because he was a domineering person and certainly not because he he was uninterested in what you and I had to say. In fact, he would hijack it chiefly by, uh, you know, he would immediately uh, get your whole life history out of you, um, want to know where you got that beautiful blue sweater, what are all these interesting things behind you, uh, do you need a drink, how are you doing, uh, where's your family name from? <laughs> You know, he, he had a, um, an unbelievably curious and delighted mind and um, and he brought it to every interaction. And, and so, yes, when I think of him now, I I think of him walking into the room and, and feeling the room immediately just become a little bigger and, and a little more full of wonder and, and, and just kind of joy in everyday life. I'm not surprised, you know, to hear more about your father's boundless curiosity and how it seems like that has been passed on to you in your really in-depth research that you do for all of your articles and your books and that sort of like detailed discovery. So it sounds like that maybe is a bit of a family inheritance there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'm so grateful literally every day to have been raised by someone uh, with, with such a broad-minded and, and humane um, interest in the world and and someone who believed in sharing that interest in the world with his kids from you know before we could talk really so uh yes i i think that my dad gave me the great gift of 
just finding life fascinating. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a, um, I think a real gift to a writer, of course, to have this, or, or maybe that's the wrong way to put it. It's the other way around. I am a writer because I was raised by someone who believed that all of the world deserves our attention. And there's always something interesting to be learned about it and to be said about it. And you mentioned that the predominant emotion in this moment of connecting with your father and his memory is joy. And I think about how there can still be missing in joy. And I wonder, like, when do you find yourself missing your father the most? And has that changed in the years since he died? It's changed quite dramatically recently, actually, uh, because I have a new baby daughter. Uh, She's uh, just a little over six months old now. You know, it's interesting speaking of joy. I mean, just by far the most joyful thing that's ever happened to me. She's a delight every moment of every day. But she does make me miss my father in whole new ways. Uh, My dad loved being a father and more broadly just loved all children and babies especially. And he would have taken so much delight in her and she would have taken delight in him. You know, my dad had the great gift of making all babies crack up immediately. It's like they could somehow just sort of see into him and know he was like the funniest guy alive because they they would truly take one look and just start cackling. And and my daughter's got a great laugh like he did. I really miss him as a, as a new parent, not even so much for, for advice in any kind of narrow sense parenting so far feels feels pretty intuitive to me which I'm sure is also a gift from him and from my mother but but just for the joy of of getting to see those two generations together so that's that's the thing that jumps out most to me in terms of what it feels like to miss my dad these days yeah and talking with people who have become parents and how that's opened a door to a new aspect of grief it seems like there's always three levels. There's like the missing of the parent being there and being part of the process, but there's the missing of the parent getting to know your child and your child getting to know your parent uh, and that there's just new new avenues to explore that loss from those different perspectives. And in your writing, you go into so much detail about how how to talk about death, like which words do we use? Lost, gone, past. I I found myself being surprised when you said you landed on the word lost as being the most apt for you. What was it about that word and how did landing on that sort of shift your experience of of dealing with loss? Mm. Well, the first thing I want to say about that is it's not at all meant to be prescriptive, (laughs) meaning, yes, that word did really speak to me after my dad died. And uh, as I write in the book, uh, certain others kind of actively did not, Uh, you know, some of these common euphemisms have passed away or or gone home or departed, um, just failed to provide me with any consolation. And in some cases raised my hackles a little bit, but I'm mindful that, you know, death is so idiosyncratic and, and grief is so specific. And I know that other people will find consolation where I did not and, and probably find, nothing where I found something rich or, or find, I, I've, I know that there are people for whom lost is actually the perfect example of a euphemism that doesn't speak to them. Uh, and they feel like, well, he's not lost, you know, <laughs> it's gone, he's dead. But for me, it really did, it did somehow give me the language I needed to think about my dad. And, and what I say in the book is somehow it seemed to have the right combination of the desperate and the resigned. <laughs> You know, um, I desperate because being lost is pretty terrifying experience, you know, being unable to find something precious or being lost yourself. Uh, the world in that moment feels very large and we feel very alone in it. And that to me felt incredibly accurate to my experience of grief that somehow when my dad died, in a, in a literal sense, my world became much smaller because because it didn't have him in it. But emotionally, in some ways, it became large, not in the good way, you know, in the terrifying scale of the whole universe. And here I am, tiny and insignificant and disoriented. And, and how do I find my way back to a place where my life feels meaningful and, and feels like it, it does have a place here and I know what it is? So yes, that loss, uh, that word loss, felt very important to me. And and it did open up for me an area to explore, right? Because it raises a lot of weird questions. I mean, people are people who chafe at the word are not wrong to do so. Meaning at some point, I remember when I was working on the book, the time I was living up in this little rented 
carriage house in the Hudson Valley. And it had these huge double glass doors all along the front of the house. And they were great for a writer because I could use them like a whiteboard. You know, you can use a dry erase marker on them and just wash it off when you solve the outline to whatever piece you're writing on. So I used to write on those doors to figure out what I was doing. And I'll never forget writing, uh, you know, grief makes us do strange things and, and things that would be horrifying to the non-grieving or, or perhaps some other grieving. But of course, dark humor is really a part of it. I'll never forget writing on those double doors. Why is my father like a sock? <laughs> Meaning, uh, what, why do these two things, you know, canonically, we lose socks, right? You put two in the washing machine, one comes out. How does this happen? I really was interested in this question of like, what do these things have in common? You know, the lost sock, the lost cell phone, the lost wallet. What on earth does that have in common with a lost election or, or with someone who's lost their faith or, or with those of us who have lost loved ones? Why do these things possibly belong in the same category or, or do they? And for me, that turned out to be a really fruitful question to explore. And I, and I hope for readers too, because that's what the first part of this book does is try to answer the question of like, what does it mean for something to be lost? And, and what can we learn from our small losses about our large ones and, and from our large losses about our small ones? Well, and I really am struck by the idea of how you know, at Dougie Center, we focus so much with kids, particularly younger kids, of the importance of at some point using dead or die just to be really clear and tangible for kids. Because if we speak in a, a euphemism for them of like, we, we lost someone or they're gone or passed on, like it just makes it harder for them to grasp the reality that someone has actually died because they just don't have the language or the cognitive capacity yet to live in that abstract world. But as adults, we do have more choice than that. Like we know someone has died and yet we can also live in these realms of like, what is the wording that works for us? And one of the most really valuable conversations we have in our group sometimes is like, what words do you use to share that someone has died? And what do those words mean to you and why? And I was grateful because I sometimes brush off the word, the word lost. And your book really enabled me to sit with the idea that like, we might lose a person, but we lose ourself in some ways. We lose our grounding, we lose our tethering, we lose items related to that person, memories, access to stories, future and past, you know, all those different things. And so also around the realm of words, like you're so precise in your writing. Grief is something that often goes beyond our capacity to articulate it. Like it defies wording sometimes. And I wondered what it was like for you to take your precision of writing and your precision with language into such a personal, you, you know, emotional experience and to, to try to find the words for it. Honestly, it was incredibly interesting uh, and, and ultimately really rewarding. Um, you know, I am not historically a very personal writer. Uh, I never expected to find myself writing a memoir uh, or something that could be categorized that way. And, you know, I've written a few personal essays in the past, including one uh, about my father's death that, that this book grew out of. Um, but it's not the mode I usually work in. And even if there's like a kind of first person or like a narrative eye in, in a piece of mind, it's usually not divulging much about myself. Uh, so it was really fascinating to take this intensely emotional experience and to your point, a fairly elusive experience and, and try to put it into words. Because you're right, of course, grief is chaotic. It's unstable. It's dynamic. It, it has a lot of properties that make it quite difficult to describe. At the risk of sounding callous, it really was quite pleasurable, which I say very carefully because of course grief is not. And I could not have written this book when I was still in the throes of the grief that I was describing, which I'm, I'm choosing my words here as well very carefully because uh, I don't mean to suggest that grief has some kind of clear cut ending and I, I got beyond it and then I sat down and wrote the book. Um, I don't believe that to be true, um, although I do think, you know, hopefully most of us are, are ultimately alleviated of, of the worst burdens of grief. Uh, but of course, it comes back at unpredictable times and in unpredictable ways. And, you know, you and I were just talking about, you know, my daughter, and I, I've grieved my father in new ways since she was born. But all that said, the parts of grief that I'm writing about in the book were parts that I had already moved through emotionally. It therefore felt possible to go back and try to move through them intellectually and, and with language in order to hopefully make them useful or meaningful to other readers um, and, and give them the language I didn't have in the moment, right? Uh, and I was reminded very often that sometimes the best you can do is 
name the mess, right? <laughs> you know, you can't always clean it up or make it tidy, um, but but you can really get deep inside it and just sit down and look at it and say, okay, here's what I see and here's what it was. And I can't resolve it all and I can't um, reorganize it all, but I can tell you with some specificity what it was like. So uh, when all else failed, I tried to at least do that. And I've watched over the years, people take really visible exhales when someone else is able to put their experience into words that other people have a felt sense of and have been grasping for a way to explain it to themselves or explain it to others. And so there is such a a gift inherent in being able to find different avenues for depicting grief with different words. I just want to, I don't want to interrupt, but I do want to thank you for, for using the word finding right there, because it is really interesting. I mean, this is a book about losing and finding and part of the, part of what made the, the, writing the lost section interesting was, of course, you're right, it actually was in itself about finding. It was about finding the language for this experience, finding what I what I could that was meaningful from it, finding what was specific but might also resonate with other people because I know it to be a common kind of experience. So anyway, don't mean to interrupt, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it, well, the other thing that kept coming to me as I was reading your book is that the finding is so much more apparent when there has been a loss of some sort. And my best description of this is if you are in a bunch of traffic noise and the traffic ends and there's that break, the silence is so much louder than it would ever be. You're so much more aware of the silence in stark relief or contrast to the sound that was just there. And I thought about that with you. You move into the second section of your book of writing the love story of, of connecting with your wife, Casey, and falling in love and finding her and finding love and how I imagine that was even highlighted more. I mean, you'd met her before your father died, but then when he died of like the loss and the found and how they have a, a really integrated relationship. And one of the things that I was wondering about is, you know, you find this love with Casey and I wonder how have you continued to find your father in the years since he died? It's a really great question. Um, the short answer is not as much as I wish I could, you know, uh, I write in the book about uh, this kind of early stage of grief when I found myself literally going out looking for him, uh, which I which I know is uh, a relatively common experience among the bereaved. I didn't find him then. And in some of those same ways, he's still elusive unto me. You know, I wish I heard my father's voice more often. I wish that I had more of him only in the way that I think all of us always wish we had more of people we've lost. You know, my father died at 74 and I'm grateful every day that he didn't die of the heart attack he had when I was in the eighth grade or, you know, didn't die when I was six, the way of, you know, friends of mine have lost their parents. On the other hand, do I wish he'd lived to be 94 or 104? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so partly I just wish I had a larger store of him than I do, uh, which I think is a common feeling. But a wonderful thing about the people we love is that that love does endure even after they're gone. And we find it in surprising ways. Uh, so certainly I do, um, I find my father in new ways now that I have a daughter, uh, partly because uh, I think even for those whose parents are alive, of course, being a parent makes you summon your parents all the time, right? Uh, you think about little things they did when you were young and you remember stories you hadn't thought of and you literally read a book that you hadn't read since you were three and a half years old. And you're like, oh my gosh, this book, like tap, tap, it's somewhere way in the back of my memory. Uh, you know, I also think about my father uh, now as someone who was married to my mom for 49 years. You know, I am very much in love. I'm married. Uh, I hope that I have at least that many years and preferably more with my partner. So I think about him as our as our marriage deepens and unfolds. I think about my parents' marriage and what it was like for them, you know, when they were first married, what it was like for them when they had their first kid, you know, he, he comes to me in those ways. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say is that a truly delightful part of writing this book, I mean, first of all, it was wonderful. I would never want to say to quote, bring him back to life because, you know, would that I could, uh, but it was certainly wonderful to get to dwell in, in my memories of him and in, in memories from my sister and my mom uh, and try to have him sort of walk into the room of the book as, as he would walk into this room with us if he were still alive. Uh, but then of course the book came out into the world and it's a real delight to hear from people who knew him. I know that I'm having that experience perhaps on a 
larger scale than than many people get to have it. But I think a lot of people who've lost someone have the truly remarkable experience of someone saying to them, you know, I knew your dad, or I knew your mom, or I knew your sister. And you hear a story you'd never heard before. And it's like just a tiny, you know, in the sort of 360 degrees of who a human being is, someone fills in a little sliver of a degree for you. And sometimes that's painful, um, but, it, but it's often really beautiful. And I just feel so grateful every time someone uh, adds another little degree to my dad. Another experience I had when I was reading your book, I kept thinking, I wonder how much Casey and Catherine's dad have in common. Are we going to hear about that? And then wham, I turned the page and it was like, yes, <laughs> there are many ways that Casey and Catherine's dad have, uh, have similarities. And you describe that in like the first time that you brought Casey home to meet your parents and, and watching them together I mean, like, oh, there's a lot of similarities. And I wondered what it was like for you to have that realization then, but also now, you know, as you said, moving forward in your life and the deepening of your marriage and, and your dad not being physically present. Mm. Um, it's fascinating to me that you wondered that, I must say. Uh, I, you must be a very psychologically astute reader and person in general, as I can tell from this conversation. Uh, but yes, uh, so Casey and my father do have certain things very strongly in common, despite in other ways being very different people. You know, there's no question that that's an enormous source of pleasure for me. And it, it was from the very first moment they met. And I kind of realized that I, I describe it in the book, sort of sitting on, on the couch in my childhood living room, looking kind of back and forth from my dad to Casey and being like, oh God, of course, right? <laughs> um, uh, and it was a real pleasure to get to kind of bring that moment to life. I guess the, the main thought I have in response to that is, I'm grateful truly every single day that they got to meet. You know, I, I feel for people who lost someone and, and, and then had someone new and crucially important enter their life, which is incredibly common and almost happened to me, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I sort of the way things went with Casey and my dad is we sort of got one of everything, right? You know, we got one Thanksgiving together. We got one anniversary. We got one Passover. Um, and I wish I'd had a million more, but I really am grateful because I feel, I think it's really easy to feel, I'm sure wrongly, but very deeply that someone who hadn't met my father would never truly understand who I am. And, and I think that's a common feeling among the bereft. And again, probably not an accurate one and, and, and therefore one to be met with suspicion and perhaps dismantled um, because I see how Casey loves me and I know she would love me and understand me even if she met me in an absolute vacuum. It's a source of real joy to me that they met and um, it's a source of real joy to me every time I something happens where I kind of think, ah, <laughs> you know, yes, you, you, you know, this is, this is familiar to me in some very, very deep way. Um, and I should say that's not just Casey. I mean, I, um, this is partly a belated answer to your earlier question about, you know, how does my father continue to appear in my life or, or how do I miss him? Or conversely, how do I feel connected to him? And, you know, the other huge source of that for me is my sister who actually channels my father very wonderfully. It's a beautiful thing about families and extended families and communities that they can, it's not that they ever replace someone we've lost, but they, they can shore up that space that's empty and, and they can fill it with their own memories or similarities or their own kind of love and abundance. And uh, I, I really am just grateful for it all the time. I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. <laughs> well, you are. And I think you speak to one aspect of grief that, again, can be so unique for every family and that, you know, sometimes there can be a lot of conflict around the reality that maybe a, a sibling relationship you both had a parent die, but your experience of that parent was so wildly different that it can almost feel invalidating versus comforting or supportive. And so always just thinking about, yeah, like the unique aspects of that. And and I appreciate that as you, you know, I imagine as you're writing about grief and you're putting your experience of grief out in the world, there's always that thought of like, oh, and it's likely not this way for somebody else. So it makes it hard to write about grief because it's such a universal, universal experience that is uh, percolates through in, in such a, a different and unique way for everybody. So it's kind of a, a conundrum in writing about grief, I think, sometimes. Oh, man, I thought about it all the time. I mean, I I guess I thought about it on two fronts. And uh, one I sort of mentioned earlier, which is, and I say it very explicitly in the book, you know, my dad's death was not a tragedy. I loved him unbelievably much. I miss him all the time. It was certainly very, very sad. But, you know, he died at 74 I, I think probably peacefully and, and certainly surrounded by 
the people he loved. And he died after an amazingly rich and wonderful life. I am mindful, uh, not least because I myself had experienced this other form of grief, that uh, it is often not so gentle, right? Uh, there are there are many losses that are tragedies and many deaths that are tragedies. They are too early, they are violent, they are terrible in one of any number of ways. So I was really aware writing the book that you know this was a really specific and in many ways a very fortunate account of grief, uh, which to be honest is part of why I wanted to write it because of course the reality of even a quote, good death is it's very bad right? and very sad. And, uh, and and that was interesting to me, you know, that even, uh, even such a relatively peaceful death after a wonderful and, and comparatively long life is still quite devastating for, for those left behind. But I was mindful of that. And I was also mindful of, of what I think you were just getting at, which is I was fortunate in another way in that I I have a remarkably loving and supportive and happy family and now a remarkably loving and supportive and happy set of (laughs) in-laws. And that's a great privilege and makes life easier in many, many ways. And one of the ways it makes life easier is it makes death easier. Frankly, even in happy and loving families, grief can really create a lot of tension and friction and pull people apart, uh, even if just for a little while. And and when those fissures are deep already, they can be made just quite terrible by grief. I tried to be really careful writing this book, not to make any claims toward universality because, uh, because grief is incredibly bespoke, you know, and, and, and how it happens and how we deal with it in the context we deal with it in, in the resources we have to confront it. I mean, everything about it is so particular to a specific experience. And I felt like really all I could do was cleave as closely as I could to my own specific story in the hopes that, and this is something I, I generally believe as a writer and as a person that actually sometimes specificity gets us closer to the universal than claims to universality can. I think that um, most of us, we're all human, right? You know, and, and, and most of us can find things in one another's stories that feel meaningful, even when they are wildly alien to our own experience. Uh, and, you know, I'm mindful that there are parts of the story I told um, that I do think a lot of people have in common. A lot of people who've gone through grief have spent time in a hospital, right? Uh, A lot of people who've gone through grief have just gotten fed up with grieving. It's boring, it's tedious, it takes over your life. Uh, So it's it's not that I don't think we have common ground. I think there's huge swaths of common ground among the bereft, but I also, I know that every life is different and every death is different. And I, I tried to stay mindful of that truly at every sentence. As I finished up the second section of your book, Found, so I read Lost, then I read Found, and before I moved into the third section, and I had this bigger picture thought, realization. I was like, okay, so loss, which is 100% guaranteed and totally inevitable in our lives, is something that we like fight against always. Like, and nobody's like, ooh, I can't wait till loss comes. It's like, I don't want that. And then love, finding love, having love find us, is something that many people are searching for, hoping for, dreaming of. And that's absolutely not guaranteed. And I thought, man, what a bad setup for humanity. <laughs> like this is this kind of sucks. And I just wondered, like, for you having spent so much time and Im- immersed in those concepts, like, what do you make of that contradiction for us as humans wandering this planet? Well, I mean, you've kind of nailed it, you know, uh, one, one would like to reverse those terms, you know, I wish that love were inevitable and joy were inevitable and that loss uh, was you no know, probable but but dodgeable, <laughs> uh, but it isn't. I mean, what do I make of that, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna um, take up your listeners times with trying to um, solve the meaning of life or, or you know, state grand <laughs> cosmological claims about why the world works the way that it does. Um, but I guess what I what I can say about that, two things, you know, one I say in the book, which is I think that the inevitability of loss, although excruciating, is morally and emotionally instructive and, and does help us remember how precious and how fleeting everything we have in life is. And without that, I don't know that we would cherish it as much. Uh, and I don't know that we would live. I mean, look, I wish we all 
<laughs> lived better lives than we do and lived them more carefully than we do and we're more gentle with one another than we are. But I think it's possible we would be a truly hopeless species if, if we didn't at least know that we have to cherish what we have and, and that it's all quite fragile and, and vulnerable to forces outside of our control. But in terms of the joy of finding, I wish it were something that rained down abundantly in every life. And I know that it's not. And I know that it's that kind of joy is distributed really unevenly in ways that are wildly unfair and absolutely inexplicable. Um, and sometimes explicable, sometimes, you know, things, problems we probably could solve as a society and we fail to do so. Um, all of that said, I, I do think that some outside of the most extreme cases of suffering, which of course do exist, and I don't want to dismiss them. I, I think that um, some of the joy of discovery rains down into every life, you know, partly just because the world is amazing, right? You know, if suffering leaves you alone for one day, you kind of pick your head up and you think, wow, you know, the world, <laughs> it's incredible out there. <laughs> Why are we here? I mean, even, even existence is a kind of, a kind of discovery, you know, and I know, again, some people don't, have the luxury of experiencing that way, including sometimes because they're just too tormented by their own minds. But, but you know, a lot of us do fall in love. A lot of us do find incredible things, God, meaning, a sense of who we want to be in life, and also trivial things that fill us with joy or comparatively trivial things that fill us with joy. You know, we find a old journal we thought we'd lost. Uh, we find an old friend we thought we lost. The absolute terms are stark, as you put them, you know, yes, loss is inevitable. Um, no, joy is not. And, and that's a real shame. But I think most of life happens uh, kind of in the gradations in between those things, which is a lot of loss happens, but a lot of life is not loss. And a lot of joy happens too, thankfully. And uh, part of why I wanted to write this book is I do think actually love and joy and discovery are pretty abundant also. And, and we could all stand to spend a little bit more time thinking about them and reminding ourselves of them and, and dwelling in that really beautiful possibility. Well, it seems to lead us into, you know, my, my next question about that third section of your book and, and how, you know, I think about the words lost. I think about the word found. There's like a, a schema in my head, right? Like, I don't know what you're going to say about lost, but I have an idea of what lost means. And then the word and is like, so broad <laughs> it's like everything and nothing all at once and I I wonder like what is your relationship to the word and and how does it fit in with the ongoing nature of your grief mm. it's a great question uh because I am mindful it's a strange part of the book in some senses or and probably the least expected part um but it's actually why I wrote the book you know this book came into being because I I had been thinking about loss as a category uh, since I wrote uh, the essay that the book grew out of uh, this, this essay about losing my father, but also losing, you know, keys and cell phones and so forth. Uh, and, and I knew very early on, there was this kind of mirror image category uh, of, of discovery and finding. And that in the same way that there was this personal story of grief, I wanted to tell at the heart of this exploration of the category of loss, there was this personal love story I wanted to tell at the heart of this category of finding. But none of that actually made me feel like I wanted to write a book. What made me feel like I wanted to write a book was kind of by chance while we were talking about this, my partner used this incredibly everyday phrase, lost and found. And because the mind is a very strange thing, I just literally like my whole brain landed on the word and, you know, the word in between. You know, in retrospect, I think that's because I did have the experience of losing my father and finding my partner in, in quite quick succession. So I had already, some part of my mind had already been busily thinking about how inseparable these things are in life, how conjoined and how we don't get to just, you know, experience our grief really neatly over here and our love really neatly over here. And, and they're always kind of jumbled up together. So that word really leaped out at me. And I thought, boy, isn't that just like the nature of reality, right? Everything is conjunction. Everything is continuation. You know, nothing stops. The world does not stop while we're grieving and let us just sit there alone in our grief, which is horrible in some ways and a great mercy in other ways. You know, uh, the world doesn't stop when we fall in love. I love this kind of convention of rom-coms and films where like, cause I, I lived it, right? You know, I'm walking down Main Street in this little literal Main Street in the town I grew up in and I see my partner and um, it did feel, my, my, you know, we'd never met before, my future partner. And it did feel like time stopped, you know, and in, in, in the, the kind of slow motion moment, but time doesn't stop. Life does go on. Your father dies the next year, you know, all kinds of things happen. And 
I was interested in exploring that kind of inevitable experience of conjunction because I think that we do ourselves a disservice when we try to look at grief absent all the rest of life because all the rest of life is always crowding in, uh, which again is often a great mercy and sometimes a royal pain in the neck. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we do ourselves a disservice when we try to think just about love as if while we're falling in love, someone isn't dying, you know, or we're not stressed out about something about work or we're in the middle of a global pandemic or whatever it may be, you know, these, I was talking to Anne Lamott, the, the, the great memoirist, and she used this um, image I just haven't been able to get out of my head. She said, you know, I was so interested in the Anne part of your book because I really like to keep the like silverware separate in my little silverware drawer, <laughs> but it just like always jumbles up. And I thought, boy, isn't that right? Like the existential <laughs> silverware drawer is a mess. You know, <laughs> the spoons are with the forks and the knives are everywhere and, and that's life, you know? Uh, and, and so, yes, that, that to me is what was happening inside this very compact little word, Anne. It was like, boy, that's actually how a lot of life works. And I want to sit and think about that. So now your book is out in the world, and it's basically an atlas of your heart. And I wonder what that's like for you as someone who isn't traditionally a memoirist or writing about deeply personal experiences of what has it been like to put it out into the world? And then the second part of that to like, get the feedback on it and to have conversations with people like me asking you very intense questions about things that you've put out in the world. So what has that been like? It's a great question. And honestly, you should probably ask me again in a year because the book is still really <laughs> fairly new. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the experience changes as all experiences do. Um, but so far, to be honest, it's been a pleasure. Um, I wrote what I regard as two great love stories, you know, the love of a father for his children and his children for him and, and uh, the love, the, the romantic love story of my partner and I meeting and falling in love. And I feel lucky to have those and I feel lucky to share them with the world. And it's a real delight to me to have people write to me about my father or about my love story and say that they feel comforted or they feel hope for their own future. Or, you know, they tell me stories about their own partner of 61 years, or they say, gosh, I had kind of given up and your book reminded me to keep the door ajar a little bit for love. And, and all of that to me is just so, gosh, the words that come to mind are so corny, but they're completely true. They're, it's affirming, it's heartwarming. It, it just makes me feel like, oh, you know, this is, we all crave a sense of hope and possibility and, and maybe more now than ever, because we've been living through very strange times. Uh, but yeah, so far my feeling is what a delight to, um, get to talk about my partner and my father basically every day, you know, and, uh, and, and with my dad, a delight. Uh, sometimes people uh, do come up to me and, or write to me and say, I knew your dad and that's thrilling. But even when they don't, uh, they write and they say, I really, I felt like I knew your dad so much that I mourned him a little bit too. And, and that's so moving to me. And I, yeah, I think right now how I feel is the sort of the opposite of invaded or what you might imagine. And, and in fairness, look, this book is actually not that personal in some ways. It's uh, it's um, it's about my life, but in ways that are very constrained and very specific to these ideas of grief and love and loss and discovery that I wanted to explore. So, you know, it's not like my every hour of every day is contained in the pages and I feel like, oh, I have, I have nothing that's my own anymore. Um, instead, I, I feel like I... I shared what's most precious to me and the world so far feels like it's rewarding that by saying, yes, this is precious. Thank you. And, and here's my own little precious thing I want to share with you in return. Well, Catherine, I'm again, very grateful for your time today and talking with me and, and for your book and for offering, you know, readers and people who are listening to this podcast again, like we're very familiar with this idea of losing and we're familiar sometimes with this idea of finding but that middle space, the and part, uh, I think that's an unexplored territory in grief that's going to provide people new places to sit and to reflect upon their own experiences with grief and with loss. So yeah, again, I'm running out of words, but appreciative and grateful for your writing and for talking with me today on Grief Out Loud. Thank you. It's truly a pleasure to have this conversation. <laughs>
And listeners, as always, I'll put lots of links in the show notes to Catherine's writing, her website, where to find the book. I really encourage you to read some of the other words that Catherine has put out in the world in addition to lost and found on loss and grief and big earthquakes and other exciting events happening in the world. So listeners, as always, I want to thank you for being part of the show, for being part of our community, for sharing episodes with people who you think might be helped or supported in some way by them. And thank you to everyone who's reached out to me recently. I've really enjoyed hearing from you. If you would like to write to me and let me know what the show means to you, you can find me at griefoutloud at dougie.org. That's D-O-U-G-Y dot O-R-G which is also our website where you can find information about our local programming, our downloadable resources, and all of the past episodes of Grief Out Loud. So thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again next time. 